Well, good afternoon, everyone. Again, I want to welcome you to University of Illinois Extension's Four Season Gardening, the 2023 Spring Webinar Series. As Andrew says, my name is Elizabeth Wally, and I am a member of the Commercial Agriculture Educator for University of Illinois Extension. And today I'm going to be sharing a selection of Illinois native plants suitable for the home garden. And I've ordered them in bloom from late winter to fall to give you an idea of the progression as we move through the season. So in addition to the time of bloom, I will discuss size, aggressiveness tendencies, light needs, and soil moisture needs. And so by the end of the presentation, listeners should have a good feel for what characteristics to look for when selecting an Illinois native plant for their garden. So with many Illinois native plants to choose from, there's only just so much time and there just isn't enough time to come close to even covering them all. So here's how I whittled my list down. I started with all the Illinois native plants I have in my landscape, which I'm very familiar with. Um, and because this webinar is statewide, the first cut was presenting only plants recorded as native throughout much of the state. So rather than just in Southern Illinois where I'm located, I've selected things that were available throughout the state. So for example, uh, Cobea uh, beard's tongue is only native populations are located in Kane County. So even though it's one of my favorites, it didn't make the cut for today's presentation. Those that did make the cut all have showy blooms and are also readily available as plants, and or seed through local nurseries, mail order nurseries or native plant sales. And finally, the majority of plants selected for today's presentations will do well in a garden setting given the right conditions and maintenance. Now to set you up, all the images from today's presentation come from my St. Louis Metro East garden or from travels nearby. And for that reason, I've noted the day and month that each pictures were taken just to give you an even better sense of when each plant will be at its most beautiful, you know, with some adjustments made for your particular location. So in addition to providing a time of bloom, I've also provided icons to highlight certain features, like whether it's a pollinator plant, good as cut flower, or whether it attracts hummingbirds or has good fall color. And with, as with, excuse me, any plant, um, details differ in what plant is attractive to what animal, especially deer. I've never had deer browse my Virginia bluebells, for example, but others have. So if you were to ask me, I would say deer don't bother them. Someone with less browsing options may have a different opinion. So nevertheless, if I found a resource saying it was attractive, I've included it for today's presentation. Excuse me. Some plants prefer, you know, direct sunlight all day, whereas others may need shade protection from the hot afternoon sun. And, you know, each of today's selections will also have noted their sun exposure preferences, as well as their preference for soil moisture for optimal growth and development. So I'm going to say now that we know what everything means on the individual slide, let's move on to how the information is presented on the slide. So I'm going to use this first slide to orient you to where all the details are located. So in the left upper left hand is the common name in large print with a scientific name written below. Um, and you'll see that if I listed more than one scientific name, it usually means that botanists have more recently changed its name or recategorized it. But it's still sold and referenced under the old name. So many of the plants that discussed today are also uh, referred to by multiple common names. So for the most part, I use the common name listed on the USDA plant website, which is listed on the reference page at the end of the presentation. So in the upper right hand is the time of bloom range, the preferred soil mo moisture uh, denoted by water drops, and the preferred sun exposure. In the bottom left are the icons representing certain features of the plant, like attractive to bees, flies, and butterflies. In the bottom right is the height range for that plant. And so with that, let's move on to the plants themselves. So staying on this same page, um, this is the cut leaf toothwort. 
And it's one of the first to bloom in my garden. You know, every year I'm so excited to see this plant because it means spring has started. So you're gonna see by the height, um, it may be short in stature, but it's, you know, it's early appearance in late winter to early spring is always eye-catching. It just really stands out. It's natively found in moist woods throughout much of the state. And I'm gonna say that you're gonna to wanna to site this one in partial shade with average soil moisture and particularly where larger plants won't overwhelm it. Cut leaf toothwort plays friendly in the garden and it has an acceptable level of spread that is really easy to manage. Dutchman's breeches, you know, I think these really look like a pair of white pants hanging upside down by its legs from a clothesline. You know, with the slightest breeze, they just dance to and fro. These little white flowers with yellow touches are common, but the pink variant, as I have pictured, is also available. The Dutchman's breeches is natively found in moist woods, usually near the bases of slopes and in wooded valleys. I'm gonna say this is another short and stature plant, so it needs to be sited where you can always see its full beauty without larger plants overtaking it. And because it's ephemeral, that means that it completely disappears after it does all of its magic. Make sure you remember where you planted it so you don't mistakenly plant something else on top. And that's very easy to do. This is also a plant that is spread by ants. So you can thank an ant for helping you spread this little beauty around. Now in my yard, it's always amazing to me on how far away new plants can spread just because of ant movement. Now Virginia bluebells, as I already mentioned, you see that it has a deer, that it's attractive to deer. I have quite a few Virginia bluebells and I've never noticed deer browsing on them, but I did find a reference that stated that they are attractive to deer, so I'm going to leave it in place. Virginia bluebells are another spring ephemeral. They really catch your attention with the periwinkle bell flowers. And they fade away to make room for summer blooming flowers. So this is one that you can just let it spread to its heart content for that reason. They're natively found in moist woods, including wooded floodplains. And I'm gonna say once established, it definitely happily reseeds to other suitable areas in the garden, but very easy to manage if it goes where it's not wanted. You're gonna to wanna to protect this one from direct sun, and it has a tendency to reseed only in those particular areas where sun is not too intense. You want to provide it with average moisture, and I'm going to say this is a fairly long-lived plant. Very nice. <clears throat> this is another ant dispersed plant. Um, bloodroot will start showing up in places beyond where you know you planted it. The showy petals in the late winter to early spring sun um, can really almost be blinding in their whiteness without the shade of leaves. So it's, it's like looking in snow on a really bright day. And much like Dutchman's breeches, bloodroot is found at the base of moist wooden slopes and valleys. Flowers with a single row of petals are more the norm but a double variant is also available and is often sold as multiplex, either as a cultivar or a variety, but it is a natural variant within the species. The double variant is sterile and does not produce seed. So it only spreads through rhizomes. So it has a tendency to stay closer to the original planting site. And also because it doesn't produce seed though, the flowers tend to last a bit longer than the single uh, flowers do. But no matter what type, once flowers have faded, the leaves will remain for much of the season. Bloody Bush's uh, native habitat is moist woods throughout the state. Not only is it early spring blue, you know, that just beautiful ox blood red, but the leaves of our native wood lily are just as attractive with their melange of light and dark green patches. So you know, interestingly, its modeled leaf pattern is thought to be a camouflage adaption to protect from the white-tailed deer predation. Though in my case, I haven't found this to always provide the best protection. 
This is also another ant dispersed plant and definitely new plants are almost always welcome. Green anemone um, is beauty in miniature. You can see my hand in the inset picture to get a size of how small these are. Another one of our tiny woodland natives. Um, cite this one where its beauty is not hidden or crowded out by larger plants. So you don't want something encroaching on this one. Its native habitat is dry to most moist open fields, woods, sorry, not fields, woods. The straight species has single flowers that vary in color from white to pink to purple, but a number of native ours are available as I've shown here, like Shove Double Pink and Cameo. Um, and like many of our early blooming natives, Ruin Enemy prefers dappled sunlight during the spring, but can tolerate full shade later in the year once the trees are in full leaf. Now, where I'm located, the red, this is about where we're at in the season. The red columbine has just started for me. And they really remind me of little red lanterns hanging from a wire. And uh, although this plant is much taller than those discussed previously, I'm gonna say the overall nature of red columbine is delicate and airy. And it really allows it to fill in, you know, in around neighboring plants without acting the thug. It's found natively in shaded areas like moist woods, savannas, fens, and limestone cliffs. The red columbine makes a great cut flower too, but if you leave it in place, the hummingbirds will come to feed once they migrate north. So I don't have hummingbirds yet where I'm at, but when they do come, this is a fairly long blooming well into June. Wild hyacinths, can definitely, I'm gonna say it's pretty notorious to be slow to develop. But boy, when it does, it's a stunner for many years to come. It's found natively in most pra uh, moist prairies, uh, open woodlands and savannas. Um, most of the growth and development occurs in the spring. So adequate moisture is critical at this time. And I'm gonna say we're running, you know, where I'm at fairly dry right now. So this is one that I make sure gets quite a bit of moisture if needed. The flowers are fairly attractive to a number of bees and flies and the occasional butterfly. I'm gonna say that the bloom stalks make a beautiful addition to a spring bouquet, but I really find it difficult to rob my garden of its beauty. You know, present in much of the state, except for the most Northern County, our Northern, our native redbud tree stands out like a beacon of spring before most trees have pushed out leaves. It's grown as either a large shrub or a small tree. The Eastern redbud does best where it's protected from strong winds as its wood is prone to breakage. And I'm gonna say, unlike our native pecan, uh, redbud doesn't tolerate much flooding but it is quite adaptable to the average well-drained garden soil. The nectar and pollen of wild geranium flowers attracts a number of bees, flies, and butterflies. It's a common plant of moist woodlands, but it's very adapted to the garden soil as well as higher light levels as long as adequate soil moisture is maintained. And so this is where if you have it in a sunny spot and it gets dry, you can see the leaves start getting a little bit of crisp around the edge. So as long as you maintain soil moisture, it can take quite a bit of sunlight. Wild geranium spreads to rice rhizomes and is all, <clears throat> excuse me, and often forms colonies, which I consider to be easily managed. You know, although there are many species of flocks, blue flocks is the e earliest, the bluest, and the most common in moist woods throughout the state. The flower color is usually at its most intense in light shade and a number of named native ours are available ranging in color from white to a really deep purplish blue. Given time, it'll spread to new locations in your garden. And if you look at a, a wild population of this, you will see quite a bit of variation in the, the deepness of purple within wild blue flocks or also known as Wild Sweet William. 
you know, I want to, I'm of an age where I know what lawn darts, you know, used to play lawn darts and shooting star really reminds me of little mini lawn darts. But really the reflex petals of this Illinois native are reminiscent of a trailing shooting star giving it its name. So, you know, interesting, the five stamens that are held together to form a beak, it is the bumblebee that has enough oomph or strength to pry them apart for pollination. The petal color ranges from white to dark pink to lavender, and there are a number of named cultivars or native bars for this as well. Um, these are found natively in woods, prairies, and shaded bluffs. Shooting stars will slowly form small colonies if left undisturbed. This is yellow bellwort, and it produces drooping pendulous flowers with yellow petals up to six inches long. It's native to moist woods. Um, the yellow bellwort is adaptable to any shady site with sufficient moisture, so it doesn't, it doesn't do well in a dry site. If deer don't browse it, yellow bellwort makes a beautiful addition to an early spring bouquet. So this is one of those plants that if they get a taste of it, they'll stay and munch on it. Golden Alexanders is a member of the Kara family, which really becomes evident by its yellow umbel-shaped flowers. Uh, its native habitat is moist woods, prairies, savannas, and usually along stream edges. Um, but it can be quite adaptable to garden conditions with average moisture. It is very attractive to bees and butterflies and is good as a cut flower. And it does readily sp uh, spread but extra plants are easily managed. You know, <clears throat> like its cousin butterfly milkweed, which I'll be discussing here soon, the world mil milkweed requires excellent drainage in soils on the drier side. So this is natively found in woodlands and moist to dry prairies. It makes an excellent addition to an alpine garden as long as you take into consideration of its taller height because most alpine plants are on the shorter side. If it's sited well, it will freely reseed, um, but any unwanted plants are very easy to remove. This member is not known as a host for monarch butterflies, but the flowers are still very highly attractive to a number of bees, flies, and butterflies. I'm going to say that deep orange is rare in the garden and butterfly milkweed definitely brings it. Though somewhat fussy in terms of establishment, this is a native that requires a site with full sun and excellent drainage. Otherwise, it tends to be short-lived. Um, avoid heavy clays or soils that tend to hold onto water for any period of time. Native to prairies, dry open woods and savannas, um, it can be often found in old fields and along roadsides as well. This is a plant really, maybe I'm speaking for myself, this is a plant I wish was more successful in spreading. And so I take the avenue of planting multiples to compensate. The flowers are attractive to a number of pollinators, including bees, butterfly, and the occasional hummingbird, as well as a larval food plant for the mo monarch butterfly. You know, this is not a purple cone flower. This is a pale purple cone flower. And unlike its cousin, the flowers of pale purple cone flower really seem to float on air currents. And that's really thanks to long, thin, leafless flower stems that em uh, emerge out of the basal tufts of leaves. These are native to prairies and open wood. Um, this one definitely doesn't like wet feet. Um, so you're going to want to site it with excellent drainage, but adequate moisture. It will take full on sun, but very tolerant of partial shade, particularly in the late afternoon in the hot part of the sun. Oh, 
foxglove beer tongue uh, forms its flowers at the top of long stems that emerge from a basal tuft of leaves. The flowers are attractive to bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. That's native to woods and prairies. Uh, foxglove beer tongue uh, prefers full sun in dry to average soil. So avoid soils that tend towards the wet end. This plant definitely readily recedes. <laughs> And you know, over time, excess plants can come to dominate a bed if not controlled through deadheading or removal. So this is one that I just monitor and edit its population and it's a beautiful addition to any flower bed. It adds good height. A number of native R's are available and they really tend towards more reddish pigmentation in the leaves, stems and flowers. And I have a couple of them listed on the slide here as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Pink, you know, is somewhat common in the garden, but there's just something about the soft pink of wild bergamot that sets it apart for me. And I think many of you know that powdery mildew can be a problem with many of the Monarda species, especially in a crowded conditions with poor air airflow. You know, but this particular species shows relatively good resistance. It's natively found on dry soils, um, but is tolerant of average garden conditions. And this is one of those plants that I'm just, you know, I'll emphasize how, how great it is. Just set up a lawn chair just to sit and watch because the blooms of wild bergamot are very attractive to bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. So, you know, at the time when the spring blooms are starting to dry up and green seems to predominate the landscape, and you're seeing here that I have wild petunia beginning to bloom in May through October, this is really a nice addition for the bloom in that particular window. It's natively found in dry woods, savannas, prairies, and limestone glades. Um, wild petunia is tolerant of a garden setting given excellent drainage in full to part sun. The flowers are attractive to bees and petals range from a light lavender to a more strongly purple color. I'm going to say, you know, in terms of habit, without support, this plant tends to sprawl on the ground, you know, and whether you support it or not, it doesn't seem to phase its ability to flower. So it is a, a pretty good bloomer in kind of a transition period in most of our gardens. <coughs> you know, I look forward to this plant every year. If you just think of a plant, I can just say, this is just pretty. You know, it's one of the larger plants and for a mint family member, I'm going to say heart leaf skull cap is relatively well behaved. You know, over time, the plant will increase in diameter as well as a number in, in number of blooms. So I, I'm going to definitely say cite it where it has room to grow and increase in size. You know, unlike some other skull caps, this is not one that produces babies at such a ridiculous rate you wish you'd never planted. I've, I've got some in the, the yard that I feel that way, but this one has never, never done me wrong. It's a beautiful plant. Natively found in both rocky and moist soils. This skull cap does quite well in garden setting given uh, full sun and well-drained soil. It is an absolute magnet for bees and butterflies. Um, so it makes a great addition to a pollinator garden if you're setting up for one of those. Now, throughout, I usually have only selected one in a group, but I thought skull caps were a good example of, you know, the variability within the genus. And so if you were to take the previous heart leaf skull cap and shrink it a lot, you'll have a small skull cap as shown here. This tops out about nine inches. Um, this is a beautiful native that's perfect, you know, for if you site it in a sunny spot in a rock garden where soils are very dry and have excellent drainage. I'm gonna say it might be small, 
but the bees and butterflies have no problem finding it just like its larger counterpart that I showed previously. You know, and like most mint, um, this one does creep, but it's rather easy to maintain by pulling up the edges and, and trimming away. So I've, I've always had good luck with this one. You know, oh, the, although, um, you know, common throughout the state, I'm going to say that hoary vervain can be fussy to establish in the garden and is well noted for being short-lived, if not successful in reseeding itself. I'm going to say, but this is one that is so beautiful, I just keep replanting it. So it's worth the effort it takes to find a good site with dry to average soil. This is a plant that's natively found in prairies, pastures, and areas of disturbed soil. And it is very attractive to pollinators and birds. <laughs> you know, oddly, in my particular garden site, um, I've, I have a lot of well-drained soil, but it seems to do what best on the very upper edge of my rain garden, which is what I have pictured here, but just an absolutely beautiful bloom on this hoary vervain. You know, I've had, I've already mentioned pink, but I'm going to say like wild bergamot, pale purple coneflower, um, the swamp milkweed brings that delicate pink that just draws you in for a closer look. And if you're looking for a more intense pink, there are named cultivars that are also available. As the name implies, uh, swamp milkweed is natively found in low wet areas and prairies, borders, marshes, ponds, or ditches. But it's another one of those that does quite well brought into a garden setting with plenty of sun and, and soil on the, you know, towards the wet end. And <clears throat> I'm going to say for that reason, this is a really good selection for the wetter parts of the garden or even a rain garden itself. Flowers are attractive to bees, butterflies and hummingbirds, as well as a larval host plant for the monarch butterfly. And the pictures I, you know, in my garden, I have this both in, in regular garden soil in a normal garden bed, but I also have it pretty far down in my rain garden as well, where it, it stays wet regularly. So very adaptable. Now, some of these plants, I'm going to just outright say, think big when considering purple joe pie weed because it easily tops out five to seven feet and it increases in di diameter as it matures. Um, it prefers full sun but is tolerant of shade in, in the late afternoon and that's how a lot of these are. They need, you know, when they're a sun plant they will take some shade in the late afternoon. I'm going to say when in bloom, this is a bee and butterfly magnet. If you have ever walked up on a plant and you can almost see a haze around the flowers just because of the number of pollinators, this purple joe pie weed is definitely one of those plants. When the blooms do fade, they are retained on the plant well into the fall and they really provide that extra ornamental appeal. So I'm going to say if you have the room, this is definitely a must have. So Illinois is blessed with a number of yellow sunflower-like native plants. And smooth ox eye is one of the first to bloom. And like all the species in Heliopsis, Rebecca, Selphium, and Rutibita, um, smooth ox eye is very attractive to bees and butterflies, as well as some of the beetles. And I have a beetle or a true bug in the far picture for you to see here. And native to open woods, savannas, and prairies. I'm going to say cite this one where it will receive full sun and excellent drainage. This smooth ox eye is known for its extended bloom period, which really makes it great for a wildfire uh, garden member, but also as a cuff flower. And the downside is it's equally known for its aggressive tendencies in terms of reseeding. So this is one that you will want to plan to thin um, this one annually. You know, I think it's always easier if you know ahead of time 
how much work is involved in a plant. But this is a beautiful plant, just needs some editing to keep it where you want it in a more formal garden setting. You know, you just really cannot beat uh, any of the mountain mints for their attractiveness to bees. And I'm gonna include butterflies and a whole host of other flower feeding insects. The slender mountain mint that I'm showing you here is one of the very fine textured ones, makes a great addition to any of the garden site with excellent drainage. You know, I selected this one <laughs> because it, it looks very, you know, refined for the formal garden. There are some pycnanthemums that just look kind of ratty in the garden, but this is one that I think has good usefulness in a more formal setting. You know, out on the wild side, the other pycnanthemums are, are good additions, but when you're moving it into a more formal garden, this is a really good choice. I'm gonna say the flowers are white with dots of purplish pink. So it kind of gives them that appearance that they're not straight white. This is a mint. So some size control is needed annually to control its size once it fills in its allotted space. You know, these are very easy to control. Again, you can kind of pull up the outer edges that are trying to creep and clip those back and you still have a nicely maintained plant. This is one of those plants that just is notoriously short-lived. So the black-eyed Susan is often treated as an annual or biennial for that reason. You know, if it conditions are favorable, it may reseed itself. But, you know, if you've got the birds and rodents out there feeding, they often consume the seed needed for the reestablishment. So I'm going to say that this one is natively found in prairies, savannas, and open woods, where it has access to moderate soil moisture and full sun. The straight species, unlike what I'm showing you here, is a traditional daisy with yellow ray flowers and a dark brown cone in the center. And, you know, almost black disc flowers. There are a number of named nativars available. Uh, the different disc flower, like I'm showing you here, the iris eyes, but there are also the different petal color, something like autumn color. So there are lots of options out there beyond the straight species. This is definitely a plant I wish was better at reseeding itself. So compass plant is another very large native that needs its space. Its common name is in reference to the flowers tracking the sun throughout the day. Almost the entire plant is covered in stiff, short hair, and it definitely is somewhat of a sandpaper feel if you rub up against it or handle it. Uh, compass plants natively found in, in a prairie, but does well in a garden setting with average moisture and full sun. And just to repeat myself, need space to expand. This is a very large plant. Not many plants can stand up to the aggression of the expansion of compass plants. So avoid planting smaller garden plants close by because this will encroach on them. It has yellow sunflower-like flowers that form on tall flower stalks, um, sometimes easily as tall as nine feet. And no matter what, the height, very attractive to bees and butterflies. So this again can kind of have that little haze of insects visiting all the low flowers. Culver's root is native to moist prairies and open woods, but it's an excellent addition to a perennial bed to add height and texture. The inflorescence is reminiscent to me of a white cam uh, candelabra at the top of a tall slender shoot. Um, somewhere upwards of seven feet. Uh, Culver's root will spread over time, but really not aggressively. Besides the straight species, there are a number of named native R's like red arrow, as I have shown here, um, selected for enhanced red pigments in the stems and flowers. So most of the native R's 
are into the pinks and purples away from the straight species white. You know, it's hard to believe that Rattlesnake Master is a member of the carrot family. But, you know, instead of the flat top topped umbels that we usually associate with the carrot family, Rattlesnake Master's umbel is in the form of a ball. And so Rattlesnake Master requires excellent drainage and full sun. Otherwise, it's quite susceptible to root rots as the soils remain wet too long. The flowers are attractive to a number of insects, including bees, flies, butterflies, beetles, and most especially wasp. It's also the host for rattlesnake master boar, um, a species of cutworm when in the larval form, or called a dark moth when referring to the adult moth. So the key with this one, excellent drainage. You know, if you want butterflies, plant liatris. Um, there are a number of species native to the US and parts of Illinois, but the tall blazing star is one that is native throughout much of Illinois. Tall blazing star would suggest it is tall, but indeed it usually tops out about three feet. This is natively found in prairies or savannas. Tall blazing star prefers dry to average soil and full sun. I'm gonna say as a special note, this plant has done well for me on the upper edges of my rain garden. So for those of you who are looking for plants for rain garden, this seems to be doing quite well where it gets a moderate amount of wet. In addition to butterflies, the flowers are attractive to bees and hummingbirds. I will say that rabbits and deer can be a problem if they get a taste. So, <clears throat> You know, just like its namesake, the cardinal flower is screaming red and stunningly beautiful. But it's often treated as an annual or at best a biannual. It is just notoriously short-lived. The per preference is light shade to full sun and wet to moist conditions. And I should say consistent wet to moist conditions. It's natively found along borders of streams, near springs or at the edge of wet woods. Um, garden soil that easily dries out is a death knell for cardinal flower. And it's really led to that reputation of being short lived. It's capable of reseeding itself if conditions are favorable, but those same conditions are what leads to successful overwintering and a longer life. <coughs> this is quite often visited by hummingbirds and a number of swallowtail butterfly species as well. So it's well worth the effort to include it in the garden. The blue cardinal flower also likes it on the wetter side, but it's much more successful in reseeding itself from year to year than its counterpart, the cardinal flower. It's natively found in wet ground, uh, including marshes and fens, but does quite well in garden setting if provided averaged wet soil and a good amount of sunlight. Its purple blue flowers are attracted to bees and butterflies, as well as hummingbirds. They're named native ours like Mitzi del Bra, and those are available with white flowers. So as you see pictured here. The native habitat of fringe loose strife is moist woods and along streams where it can get sun. And like many species in the family, fringe loose strife can spread fairly quickly. And it really needs to be divided or downsized quite regularly, if not annually, particularly if you're trying to keep it in a confined space. You're going to want to plant this one in a moist, sunny spot um, where it will have room to be a real specimen, you know, and really show off its beauty. The extra amount of work to keep it in check is well worth it. There are named native ours, like the one shown here. This is firecracker. This offers the chocolate foliage compared to the normal green. Then I'm going to say by late to late, mid to late summer, starts to soften and become more green. It's a really nice contrast to those bright yellow flowers. Right now, the leaves are still very strongly the chocolatey brown color. You know, to me, 
nothing announces the coming of fall like the golden beacon of goldenrod. Stiff goldenrod, like its relatives, is a favorite of bees and butterflies, as well as a larval food plant for a number of moths and flies. Uh, songbirds, <laughs> songbirds are often seen using stiff goldenrod as a perch while enjoying abundance of seed later in the season. I'm going to say overall, goldenrods can be a tricky proposition in terms of aggressiveness. Some are aggressive spreaders through underground rhizomes, and some are aggressive reseeders, and some are both. I'm going to say stiff goldenrod falls in the category of an aggressive reseeder, particularly if the birds and rodents don't do a good job. This means you'll need to deadhead before seeds form, or you need to thin extra plants annually if growing in a small space. Garden flocks is natively, excuse me, natively found in woods, along streams and valleys, and along the wood's edge. In the garden, it performs well in full sun to part shade with average moisture. Excuse me, flowers of the straight species are most often kind of in that magenta range, um, but there's an amazing number of native R's in a wide range of colors, and in some cases offering powdery mildew resistance. Gianna, which I have pictured here, is an example of a name selection that was discovered growing along the Harpeth River uh, near Nashville, Tennessee. What made it stand out was its mildew-free foliage, and um, fortunately, that trait carried through when propagated and trialed for the nursery trait. Butterflies and hummingbirds are very attracted to the flowers, and deer and rabbit are known to feed on the entire plant. You know, if conditions are conducive, garden flocks will readily reseed some more than others. You know, I kind of have a <coughs> love-hate relationship with gray-headed coneflower. I love it because it's a beautiful pollinator plant. And its seed heads are attracted to a number of birds. So I see per birds perching on these plants quite regularly. The problem is, is that it's a prolific reseeder. And in years where birds, mice, and other seed eaters fail to eat everything that's dropped, it can be really tedious to do plant removal if you're trying to keep it more maintained in a more formal garden bed. So for a beautiful late summer bloomer that has some size, you can see that this can easily be three to five feet tall. I really like gray-headed coneflower. If it just wasn't so prolific, I would like it even more. So cup plant is, a, is, is just big. And it only gets bigger with time and quite easily overtakes smaller plants planted too closely. So it can be a thug to take its half of the middle. Needless to say, cup plant might not be suitable for a small garden where space is at a premium, especially since the removal of unwanted plants is challenging. So, you know, before when I said unwanted plants are easy, that means they come out of the ground really easy. Cup plant is definitely not that. This is full scale digging a fairly significant hole to dig up plants that have been let to go. I'm gonna say though, on the upside though, it is very easy to grow in full sun and average to moist soil. And it makes quite an impressive specimen if you have the space for it to really show its beauty. So I'm going to end our season with New England aster. I'm not sure what catches my attention more, the absolute mass of flowers or the absolute mass of pollinator insects checking out the flowers of New England aster, especially late in the season on a warm, sunny day when there's not a whole lot of other things out for the pollinators. This tends to be a large plant. Uh, that if left unsupported, it will lodge over to form a mound. So I'm going to say make sure you leave plenty of room around this plant for it to do a belly flop. It's fine that it does because it is quite impressive with its blooming. And so 
I'm going to say with that, I've come to the end of the season. I have hoped that you have found a few Illinois native plants to acquire and round out your bloom season. You know, if I can't be out looking at plants, I always enjoy reading about plants, especially their descriptions and native habitat. And I really feel that knowing that you're a whole lot less likely to kill a plant needlessly. You can build an entire library around natives, but I only have listed here one, uh, the vascular flora of Illinois. This is definitely not a picture book, but rather a dichotomous key for identifying plants based on plant anatomy. The rest of the references are websites that not only include pictures, but range maps, descriptions, and preferred growing conditions. And I will say that I use all of these to support today's presentations, but they are kind of my go-to in general when I'm looking up information for a plant. And as Andrew said, this presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded to the University of Illinois Extension Horticulture YouTube channel. I'm going to say in approximately two weeks. So if you want to grab your smartphone and take a picture of the screen, you can say that. And if you want to listen to this again, you can go to YouTube and, and slow it down and look at some of the details I've provided. I want to thank you for your attention. Before I take questions, I'd like to encourage you to scan this QR code with your mobile device. This should take you just a, sh a short amount of time to fill out a short survey about today's presentation. I will say the team appreciates your additional time to provide feedback. And with that, I'll check back with Andrew and Gemini to see if there are any questions, and I'll be glad to try and answer.